So, um, the uh, Slovenian <coughs> case study um, will be interesting from several points of view because um, it, is a, it is a country that, in terms of its politics, setup, and issues, was straddled the two categories that we had used. Um, one of the two well, zones that we have discussed about the Central European zone and the countries of former Yugoslavia, right? Um, and you will see aspects of both, and it's, it will be basically up to you to decide well which is actually the case. I will give you hints, of course. So, what do we know about uh, uh, Slovenia uh, to start with is that, um, well, as a state, it is a relatively uh, small. Country, uh, two million inhabitants. Uh, also, in terms of territory, it is uh, a small uh, territory, um, and fairly, it is also in terms of uh, composition, it is fairly homogeneous. Yeah, it has some ethnic minorities, and here's an interesting uh, aspect about ethnic minorities: that that so, uh, in the Slovenian constitution, these ethnic minorities, which are not sizable, uh, are classified in two different categories. One of them is the so-called indigenous ethnic minorities. And they refer to these indigenous ethnic minorities, namely Hungarian and Italian. Uh, Slovenia is in between these countries, right? Uh, Hungary, Austria, Italy, Croatia to the east. Um, uh, and by the way, a beautiful country. Slovenia, mountains, sea, whatever you want. Uh, so, uh, they classify these Hungarian and Italian ethnic minorities as indigenous. And by that, what, what do they mean? They mean that they understand uh, that these ethnic groups are constitutive of the Slovenian state. And by that they mean the fact that they have been part of it, part of this society since forever, basically. Uh, and to understand that, uh, the, what this means is that, let's contrast that with the other ethnic minorities, because there are others as well, Serbian, Bosnian, Macedonian, Croatian, Albanian, which came to Slovenia after World War II. As you see, they are not constitutive of the Slovenian society in a historical perspective for centuries and so on. Uh, so the Hungarian and Italian uh, ethnic minorities are part of this Slovenian society. They partake into what the Slovenian society is and hence their constitutive. So in the constitution they will be treated differently. And for example, in the, they will have reserved seats, these two will have reserved seats in the, in the lower house uh, of, the, of the parliament. So that's an interesting thing, and it, maybe it's a nice model to keep to take into consideration to think could it, couldn't it be also applied in other states that we have discussed um, where certain ethnic minorities are clearly constitutive since they have been there forever, right? The whole debate between the nation-state and ethnic minorities, right? Uh, perhaps this is a way to bridge it, to understand that these ethnic groups are constitutive of the state, but that is another question. So let's talk then uh, uh, about uh, the state of Slovenia. How is it organized? Well, it's a small country. It is for basically homogeneous um, to a large degree. So yes, it will be a unitary state. It's logical that it will be a unitary state. However, the main unit of government um, underneath the, 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 the central government is the municipality. And in fact, local government uh, has a long tradition in Slovenia of, of, of self-governance, of power, or well, think of its history. Slovenia never had a state before 1992, basically, and it only became separated from the you know, Habsburg uh, sphere, uh, the Austrian sphere of influence, German sphere of influence. German was part of the Habsburg thing forever in its history, only after 1918 was, became part of something else the Yugoslavia as a kingdom and then as a communist state. So you see, actually, this history is more tied to, you know, the Habsburg, the, the century group, uh, even culturally, civilizational, but also political. But it never had a state, right? So the, the administration was always local, right? Which explains why the main unit of organization underneath the state is the local municipality. Okay. Um, okay, so let's look at the political system. What can we say about the political system of Slovenia? Uh, well, perhaps we could say that it's uh, in between parliamentary and semi-presidential. I would argue that it is actually more parliamentary with a stronger president. A parliamentary with a stronger president, right? Um, and you'll see why. So, let's, let's look at this uh, political system. So, the president, here's what makes it different, right? Is that the president is directly elected. 
So that's uh, for a five-year mandate, two mandate maximum, directly elected by the population through a you know, two-round voting system that you have become familiar with. Um, so that's one important clue that this is not quite a pure parliamentary system. Whenever the president is directly elected, again, in a representative democracy, that gives him or her a mandate, right? A very important popular mandate, a very important source of legitimacy and power. Uh, secondarily, um, the president in the Slovenia is, is head of state, so the you know, typical role for a president of the parliamentary system is to be head of state, but he does have also some head of government functions uh, or there, thereabouts. For example, the appointment of some of the judges from the Constitutional Court, of course the nom nominating a, pre a prime minister after parliamentary elections, uh, which, as you know by now, in certain more fragmented uh, um, societies, political systems, it's an important source of influence, right? Um, also, <clears throat> dissolving the legislature and calling elections, uh, being the head of the armed forces, I mean, commander-in-chief at least, you know, nominally. Well, you see, these are more than just, you know, a, a, a very symbolic position like the president in Hungary or in, um, in Germany, for example. So, uh, so yeah, so it's more than just the typical president in a parliamentary system. Then, the most powerful and important, well, the most important institution in a parliamentary system normally is the parliament itself, although it might not be the most powerful in effect, how the whole thing works on a day-to-day -day basis. But, you know, this is where popular legitimacy is located. So, yes, Slovenia, and here's a surprising thing, Slovenia has a bicameral parliament. Now this is a, could be a conundrum, like why does Slovenia have a bicameral parliament? It's not the federal system, it's small, it's homogenous. Why? I mean, Hungary has 9 million inhabitants and it has unicameral, right? Still homogenous. So why bicameral? Well, let's see. The lower house, first, the lower house, the most important one, the effectively powerful house of the legislature, called the National Assembly, has 92 seats, you see, small, accordance with the size of the population. Why, why have it larger? Uh, elected every four years through PR uh, with a 4% threshold. So PR, right, it means that you will get also smaller parties represented, still you, you do have a threshold. And after it is elected, obviously, it will appoint the Prime Minister and so on. Uh, that's the National Assembly. This is the most powerful house of the, of the legislature. This is where laws are passed. The appointment of the Prime Minister of the Cabinet depends on the forming a majority here. Okay, and now I'm going to ask, yeah, but you just said that uh, this is a bicameral system, so what about that? Indeed, there is an upper house, by the way, don't forget that two seats here are reserved for the indigenous um, ethnic minorities, Hungarian and Italian. There, um, the, the upper house, the upper house is called the National Council. And this is why I posted the link on Canvas specifically separately for the upper house, because, and not for the National Assembly, which you, you know what it deals with, what it does, right? It's a typical parliamentary house, right? A parliamentary, uh, a typical house of legislation in a parliamentary system, right? It de on it depends the executive, you can remove the executive, you all know those things already, right? But what's about this National Council, right? First of all, what does it represent? And then what does it do? Well, does it... It's not a federal state. Well, the interesting thing is that the upper house in Slovenia is uh, built, is constructed on the corporatist principle of representation. The corporatist principle of representation, namely that what you uh, represent are the different corporate bodies in the society. So not the bland, uh, uniform, uh, leveled mass of the population, but specific entities, specific, specific bodies in the population that have their own interests, their own outlook, their own weight in the population. To translate this, the National Council is constituted, uh, the mandate is five years here, it's four years here, uh, constituted in two ways. Uh, half of it basically, 40 members, half of, basically half, it's for 18 basically, of the 40 members, are elected by 
different professional groups in the society. So, for example, business, trade unions, farmers, crafts, doctors, whatever it is. And they, so these corporate bodies elect, send their represent, representatives to the National Council, uh, the Japanese Fed. Um, and clearly then the role is to represent that interest and the outlook and the perspective of that corporate entity within the society. Right? By the way, this is not unique. The Republic of Ireland has a similarly constituted um, upper house. And this harkens back to the Middle Ages, to the concept of guilds. And remember to the fact that the constitutive elements of the, of the state were not the bland mass of the population, but were different groups in the population. Cities, aristocracy, clergy, guilds, and so on. They formed the state, not the whole mass, right? Which is a modern invention, hence a nation state, hence citizenship, hence whatever. So that's the principle. So half of them represent representative of such corporate groups, and half of them are actually elected by local governments, basically. Local, they represent the local government. So local interests and corporatist interests. Very interesting. This also ties into the fact that the National Council is not a full-fledged upper house, in the sense that uh, you know, it doesn't have to, um, that its function is more consultative. Okay. So laws are mostly passed here. This is where laws are passed. National Council examines laws, gives opinion, adjustments, suggestions, improvements, amendments, whatever. It doesn't have absolute veto power. It can pass a sort of a veto, but National Assembly can bypass it. So that's called a suspensive uh, veto, where it, can, it, it, it sort of suspends a law, but then the National Assembly can pass it. So it's, it's always mostly consultation of bringing in the opinion, bringing in the expertise of these dimensions of the society, right? Again, not a, not a strange, not a foreign idea. Again, somewhat reflecting uh, the German system. There are parallels between the German and the Slovenian system. Uh, okay, so that's the National Council, uh, a fascinating example. Uh, the judiciary, uh, just a, a few words about that, um, just like in other countries that we have examined, the judiciary in, the, in Slovenia uh, divides the regular system of courts, which have you know, regular courts, appeals courts, and the highest court of appeal, the Supreme Court. That's the, you know, all civil, criminal, administrative cases go there. So that's the regular judicial system. And then separately, there's a constitutional court that deals with the protection of the constitution, judicial review, and so on. You've seen this before. So we have the regular system of courts, the highest court, the Supreme Court, and then separate constitutional court, which deals with the constitutionality of the laws, with the functioning of the system, making sure that the whole system remains democratic, protecting human rights and the constitution itself. Okay, and don't forget to also read the preamble and the first parts of the constitution that are linked also on campus. So, that is, that is the gist of the, of the, so this is the legislature. Um, the prime minister is uh, obviously um, uh, nominated after each national assembly popular election. Based, uh, so the president asks the person, the, usually the head of the largest party or the coalition that has the majority to form a cabinet, right? Uh, here there is a leeway because what if there isn't a majority then who does the president ask? This is you know, the typical you know, uh, situation of when the president can have more of an impact, especially since he's directly elected and so on. Uh, but basically the prime minister is nominated after each election, forms the government, and actually in Slovenia the prime minister is, just like in Hungary, the most important policy actor. This is where the Prime Minister shapes the direction of the country, he's the most important political actor in the sense of governance, of setting the directions of policy of running the country, he is the Prime Minister, so we can simply say that it's a parliamentary system with a stronger president. Okay, so that being said, parties and elections. Let's look uh, over a few uh, elections and aspects of, the, of politics in, in, uh, in Slovenia. Um, we are not going to go over all the elections since 1992. We, in both Slovenia and Croatia, will look at the first elections just to understand what happened there, and then at uh, so the transition, and then we'll look at the most recent ones to kind of have a sense. So first elections, uh, so uh, after 92, 
Here's another moment when you see that Slovenia actually is a Central European country rather than an ex-Yugoslavia country. Because um, due to its quick secession, quick leaving of Yugoslavia, quick and fairly painless, generally speaking, secession from Yugoslavia, um, unlike in Croatia, Serbia and other countries of former Yugoslavia, the first election and the next elections in the first 10 years were not spent on gaining independence, they were not spent on fighting for the nation, for the nation state to establish a state, were not spent on nation and state building. And that was reflected in the first election. In Croatia, as you see, and it was in Serbia, the first election were won by nationalists, right? Those people who were fighting to establish the nation, establish the state, establish the nation state. Of course, right? They were the ones that needed to get the power to establish that. But that was done here before the election. The, the, the transition was quick and uh, to statehood. So the first election was actually very similar to the first elections after 1989 in the century, not in Romania and Bulgaria. So in the first elections you have, so first elections, you have a, a broad anti-communist coalition, sounds familiar, called Demos, and actually Demos, as you know from Greek, means uh, um, uh, the people, right? But it's, an, it's actually a coalition um, of all the anti-communist forces opposed by the reformed communists. So that's the first election, so exactly like in Hungary, Poland, Czech Republic. And of course Demos wins overwhelmingly, and of course they form the government, and of course they introduce market reforms and democratic reforms, and it's as early as 92, okay? Before Romania, before, uh, and so on. Um, uh, and of course they fail, and of course this whole coalition falls apart and other parties are formed. Sounds familiar? Yes, indeed. So, that being said, uh, the next thing to, to, to mention and to keep in mind is the that uh, the major political forces that have dominated Slovenian politics since, 99, since the 90s, uh, up to recently, up to recently, not up to today basically, um, would be fairly um, stable. And that's interesting, that you will have a fairly stable political system with some fluctuation among other parties, uh, and there will be commonalities regarding the party systems in all this, as in, as in the rest of Central Europe, that parties are fairly weakly institutionalized, that parties are more built around personalities, that the ideology is not as clear, that party elites also become involved with corruption. I mean, all of these things that we have seen in the other Central European part countries, yes, here as well. But fairly stable political system with fairly stable parties, more like Hungary, right, uh, than Poland, for example. So let's look at these major parties since uh, the 90s. SDS is the center right and it's uh, the Slovenian Democratic Party and it's again, it's the center-right so mostly neoliberal so center-right uh, mostly neoliberal economics and socially conservative so, you know, a familiar picture uh, there formed from the former anti-communist opposition the, on the major figures here since the 90s was Janez Jansha we'll meet this name later then on the center-left is the Social Democrats, whom you guessed are the former Reform Communists. So again, Central Europe, Central Europe, Central Europe. Uh, former Social Democrats, an important figure here is Borut Pahor. Again, you'll see him later. And another interesting uh, party uh, is Desus, which has been a constant of uh, Slovenian politics, and it still is a constant of Slovenian politics, and actually it's the uh, Democratic Party of Slovenian pensioners. Okay? Well, why pensioners? Well, one, it is a large mass of voters. Two, they're united by the same interests. Three, they have been the, one of the social categories most affected by transition, right? Economic transition, right? A more older, on fixed income, with the cutbacks in social welfare. It's very easy and fairly straightforward to mobilize this voting population. And it's not as removed from the American politics for example, because in American politics, the most important powerful lobbying organization in the whole country is AARP, AARP, which is the American Association of Retired Persons. They are the most powerful, largest, most muscle than anyone else, for the same reasons, for the same reasons, right? Uh, so Desus has been around, and just like other smaller, more niche parties, 
uh, they have been able to jump into different coalition governments because their interests are so specific, because their, their, their clientele is such a niche that is stable and always pursues certain uh, uh, interests. Um, so they have been able to co enter into different coalitions as long as their interests were, uh, uh, were followed. And I'm going to follow, uh, continue this in the second part of the video.